This is a Digital Music Trends 152 on the 2nd of October 2013. This week on the show, a new bill in the US to introduce performance royalties on traditional radio, Sound Drop's new funding round, Beat's new investor, Spotify's Spotlight feature, Songs as partnership with Foursquare, and the significance of the YouTube Music Awards. This week's show is sponsored by media law firm Sheridan's at sheridan's.co.uk. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and DMT is available as an audio and video show on a variety of channels including iTunes, uh, most podcatchers, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, Spreaker, Stitcher and TuneIn Radio. To get in touch with the show you can tweet us on at DigiMusicTrans or email us on uh, digital music tr- uh, contact at DigitalMusicTrans.com and this week I'm super happy to welcome to the show Scott Cohen, uh, founder of the company The Orchard. So hi Scott and how's it going today? Good, uh, everything's going great. Decent weather here in London. Absolutely, yeah. It's, uh, we're having a, a pretty mild uh, autumn, which is, uh, which is pretty good. And also joining us on the show is Chris Ruren, uh, author of Freeloading, How Our Insatiable Hunger for Free Content Starves Creativity. So hi, Chris, and great to have you on the show, and great to see you after uh, DC. I think it was last time we, uh, we saw each other. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, right. the World Creators Summit. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That yeah, was, uh, yeah, that was an, yeah. Interesting, uh, an interesting few days. Yeah, it's a great, great to be here, and yeah, it's... 85 degrees, it's going to be 85 degrees here in New York today, so wow. pretty excited about that. That's pretty cool. And uh, first up, I usually like to do a little uh, plug from, from the guests. So Scott, uh, anything exciting coming up from the Orchard in terms of other features or artists that, you, that you're excited about? Do you know, we have so many things coming out every day and every week. <laughs> I'm um, sure. <laughs> no, I'm just excited about the, the sheer volume of and great uh, great talent that, that keeps putting stuff out week after week. Absolutely. That's great. And uh, uh, Chris, on, on your front, of course, I would recommend the book Freeloading to the listeners to go and check it out on Amazon. Uh, aside from that, anything else that you're excited about or want to talk about? Well, I mean, yeah, lots of things happening with the book that I'll be announcing mm-hmm. soon on social media, but uh, the paperback version of David Byrne's book, How Music Works, just came out, the black cover, yeah. and there's a nice... A uh, couple of paragraphs where he discusses freeloading and and me. Um, That's great. In uh, yeah, in, in that book, and the book's going to come out in the UK in July. Uh, Audio book is coming out imminently. So yeah, things are things are still popping with that. That's great. That's awesome. And yeah, I, I love how music works. It was such a great book. So yeah, uh, I look forward to seeing the the additional bits for from the paperback version. And uh, and so this week, it's only fitting to start in in these times of U.S. government shutdown uh, to uh, <laughs> to start uh, uh, with uh, <laughs> talking about. Can we about... blame Chris? <laughs> Is this your fault? <laughs> Maybe. It's all my fault. Yeah, yeah it's all I'll your say, fault. I'll shoulder all the blame. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought yeah, it, was yeah. only, it was only fitting to start with uh, by talking, about, talking about a bill. So, uh, you know, a bill that has generated quite a bit of press this week, uh, which uh, was, uh, uh, you know, introduced by U.S. Congressman Mel uh, Watt, uh, and it's called the Free Market Royalty Act. So this bill would see, it that, see to it that radio broadcasters uh, will have to compensate musicians and recording artists for the performance of songs over the air. So these uh, fees you know, these uh, this performance royalties essentially would apply to uh, AM and FM stations, uh, ending the special arrangement that the music industry has had with the, with the, the, the radios, uh, which uh, essentially granted, granted them free play, as far as the master is concerned, uh, of uh, music in exchange for uh, publicity. So this is a, a very interesting uh, a new bill that's been introduced. Of course, uh, the music industry has been trying to push in this direction uh, ever since the days of Frank Sinatra. I think that was the first time that a bill of this kind was uh, uh, was, you know, they tried to pass a bill of this kind. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing about the bill as well is that it won't impose uh, a, a particular license fee or a compulsory license fee like for most uh, other uh, uh, performance uh, royalties that, that are out there, uh, but it, it, it will be something that is negotiated uh, from the market, so it will, be, it will be a negotiation between the radio stations and uh, the rights holders that will uh, eventually lead to agreeing uh, to some, some sort of set of fees. So uh, this is an interesting, uh, you know, an interesting bill. Um, I have my doubts that it's going to get approved, but as a hypothetical, uh, Scott, uh, what do you think about this um, massive change in the, in the way that, uh, that you know, master owners are compensated from radio stations in, in the States. Yeah, I, I listen, I, I totally support the notion of this bill. Um, the timing is just a half a century too late. Um, this isn't, we're not in an era where uh, 
radio and is is on the rise. We're, it's all being replaced with digital. Yeah. So it's I don't want to say it's pointless because you know it's a long slow ride on its way down. But it, you know, it's like imposing something on you know ringtones. You know, they yeah. were great, but missed the moment. You know, it's. <laughs> You know, now if you if you can imagine in America when you have somewhere around thirty million subscribers to um, Sirius XM radio, well, the master owners are already compensated for those performances. So yeah. we're moving more in that direction and less in, in in the direction of radio. But with that said, it doesn't mean it should be ignored. Of course. That the, the master owners should get compensated, and the artist, and everyone that's creating for that, they shouldn't just get a free pass. Yeah, yeah, Chris, uh, on your front, you know, radio has been the, I guess, the original freeloader as far as music is yeah. concerned. So, so, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, uh, you know, it's definitely a few decades too late, but at the same time, um, you know, I, I'm I'm somewhat bullish on the continued influence of radio. Um, in terms of music discovery, there have certainly been studies that have shown that it, it remains to be a pretty sticky format when it comes to um, fans finding out about artists. And, you know, when I'm, when I'm home in New York and I'm online all the time, um, it, I can certainly understand the mentality that um, everything's digital, right? Like, digital is what's relevant, everything else is irrelevant. But at the same time, uh, you know, I'm from the Midwest, I'm from... Uh, Wisconsin, you know, um, and I go back to Wisconsin and Mo uh, Minnesota uh, during the summer. And when I'm there, I'm I have a car, you know, I'm us using a car and I'm driving around. And, you know, it, it's a it's a nice reminder for me that most people who are commuting every day, who are driving, they're still using radio and they yeah. still, you know, do depend on it to uh, to find out about artists. So, you know, I think it's going to continue to be relevant. I think it's this is a great step forward. But certainly I'm excited about the prospect of taking all of the um, kind of discontent that's out there in regards to internet radio, um, in regards to payments and Pandora, and being artists, all of, all of a sudden, they have something to get behind and yeah. to rally around. And, um, you know, who knows, maybe, maybe this is the right time. And um, with some participation from, from a broad artistic community, um, this could resolve a lot of the debates that we've been having, at least as it were, in regards to legitimate services. The illegitimate service problem uh, is still out there, and it's it's clearly work to be done to uh, you know go after piracy. But um, but I'm I'm guardedly optimistic about it. Yeah, I mean, my key question is whether this is something that should be government mandated uh, through a piece of legislation like like this one. Um, because on the other hand, uh, we've seen uh, the private sector moving into this arena with a deal that was made between uh, uh, Warner Music and Clear Channel uh, just about 10 days ago, whereby uh, Warner Music will start receiving performance royalties from uh, the uh, music that Clear Channel plays on its uh, um, terrestrial radio networks in exchange for uh, uh, Clear Channel being able to uh, negotiate a lower uh, licensing fee for the use of Warner's tracks uh, in a digital domain for uh, uh, something like iHeartRadio, for example. So um, I I'm wondering whether this is an attempt to regulate a market that otherwise would uh, strongly favor the larger players in the industry, like the Warner's and the Universal's and, and the Sony's of this world, uh, uh, to be able to negotiate these uh, performance royalties from terrestrial radios in exchange for something else, whilst all the other independent players would be left out of that particular pot of money. Uh, Scott, w w would that s is that something that maybe would concern you because it's coming from an independent perspective? Well, I don't think the independents would be left out of those negotiations right. without speaking specifically about what our negotiations have been. Sure. But, but, uh, but I also do believe it, it, should, be, um, it should be a government mandated um, license it, yeah. because radio is licensed. It is, it, is, it is how it should be done. You know, they're granted special licenses from the government to, to broadcast and they have to follow very certain ru rules about it and that's, that's one of the reasons. Uh, am I allowed to talk about why why radio <laughs> isn't going to be around for much longer or of course, should yeah, we yeah. just let that <laughs> can, is this, can I re have a rebuttal against Chris who am just hey, in, yeah. a, in a healthy way of course yeah, sure. <laughs> in, in a, and by the way I thought you were born a hipster 
but you moved to Brooklyn. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, I, 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 I don't know that that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, whole, that's subject for a whole other show. All right, that'll be, that'll be part two. No, I mean, listen, I, I, radio. Where do I, where do I start? I mean, maybe I'll start with with uh, teenagers or or even younger. Do you really think they're going to their parents and going, you know what? Fuck that iPad. Please buy me a radio. Do you think any kid is getting those devices, or do you think? A kid, you can explain to them that while you're listening to this song, if you don't like it, you just have to keep waiting because maybe you'll like the one after that. And if you don't like that one, don't worry, just keep waiting. Maybe you'll like the one after that, and then there'll be a, a six or nine minute advert break yeah. where you have to listen to that. I mean, the idea of radio is kind of over. I, I think curation of music and delivering it to people absolutely you need that i think that when you when you also get into things like the automobile like chris brought up i mean within the next four years 80 percent of all the automobiles um sold in north america and western europe will be connected cars be connected cars and now given the choice of listening to a very tightly programmed radio station with advertising or accessing your your spotify rdo deezer account your own personal collection or anything else i think is going to greatly impact radio and take away a significant market share i think the infrastructure of radio and having those towers and make some unsustainable in the future and i think overall the government that grants those licenses for radio broadcasts and saying to us that no we can't get faster mobile 4g networks we can't get faster broadband because we've used up that spectrum so somebody can play eight songs in an hour it seems yeah. crazy to me i mean if i were if I were in your position and I was having to, you know, evaluate the environment and make bets on where is growth going to be in the future, right? I don't think I would be putting all of my cards into radio. So, you know, I, I absolutely see where you're coming from there. But what I'm saying isn't necessarily that radio is going to be, you know, this growth industry or the, you know, the one dominant format. What I'm saying is it's going to remain relevant. And this is still a huge billion dollar industry out there where radio stations are getting a tremendous amount of revenue from advertising. Now, is that going to completely disappear in the next five years or 10 years or 15 years? Maybe. Um, but uh, as of right now, it's all I'm saying is it's, it's still relevant. And as of right now, it, you know, it's not about teenagers asking their parents to get, to get a radio. Of course, nobody's doing that. Um, it's, it's a, a question of, you know, right now people still are using terrestrial radio in their, automobiles so for the time being until that transition happens whether it's you know speaking about digitization and these uh you know these innovations and 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 evolutions there are shitloads of predictions that have been made over the years most of them have been wrong so i'm i'm reluctant to make assumptions about you know huge shifts that are going to happen in the next five years. We'll see. Maybe, you're, maybe, maybe it's true. Maybe yeah. people will com completely convert to satellite. But for now, I, I, I would just say it's still relevant. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I, I, I see it as kind of like the collapse of the CD, that once digital's on the landscape, then you, you, you know, it was pretty obvious in the 90s what was coming, even though we still have CD stores and they're still the, the number one, you know, format in many still ways. Still driving the industry. However, it's, it's, we're just writing it down to the bottom. We see where it's going. It's not going to be the future. It's, so it's just about picking a date. You know, yeah. when does radio, you know, drop? Certainly in terms of ad revenue, you know, advertisers are are less inclined to give a radio station money. As a matter of fact, that's been flat for a very long time yeah. um, because they just have some random demographic information. They don't even know how many people are listening or who they are. Versus when you're when you're in a digital environment, um, you know exactly 
who's listening. who's listening, not a demographic, not a psychographic, but exactly who's listening, how much, what else, what else are they doing, what do they like, um, just so much more powerful. And the money is just pouring into that and away from a terrestrial. So I guess what I'm saying is all of these things, you know, it's kind of, you know, chip away, you know, at, at radio. It's not one big thing. It's a lot of little things. And if you lose, you know, five or 10% of your business this year, five or 10 the next year, then it just collapses at some point, falls well, over. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess it's just, we don't really know what's going to happen, you know, and you don't know what consumers are going to choose. And consumers don't always choose efficiency. Um, and they don't always want to be in control of the music they're listening to either. Um, you know, I don't think it's a it's a sure thing that streaming services and the economics of streaming services are going to play out, you know, in a hugely pop profitable manner. And it strikes me that most of the people who are running these services are more inclined uh, to get a IPO and to cash out. You know, I don't I don't know if if the folks who are working for these companies are really in it for the next 20 years. Um, so, you know, we'll see, you know, not some people like to be served and, sure, uh, I'm with you I, again. Yeah. I absolutely believe that there is so much stuff out there mm -hmm. that most people have no interest in. They want things curated and brought to them. Right. I'm just saying radio is not going to be that medium. Traditional radio. Yeah, exactly. Traditional radio. And, and, and Scott, you're talking mm -hmm. about, you're talking about a generational shift and, and, a generational shift of of one that is going to take you know ten to twenty years to take place. So yep. of course we're not talking about immediacies uh, here, but uh, I do see like you know if you look at the twenty years down the line, even if there are broadcasts that are similar to radio that involve. I mean I I feel personally that one of the things that are left out from the new services that are out there is the lack of uh, uh, talk integration. So for example, uh, people love radio because there is that interaction with the DJ uh, there is the opportunity to get weather updates news updates that are local to you and so that element of it still has to be cracked by any of the music services out there that there's no integration at the moment with talk uh, almost uh, anywhere apart from slacker and uh, I've seen this new deal with uh, between iHeartRadio and, and Spreaker which is uh, quite interesting so so I feel like that's gonna be like a very interesting place as well for for things to to evolve into yeah and I, and I think the fact that CDs haven't collapsed more um, is an example of, uh, you know, the unpredictability of <laughs> consumer choice and what they really want. You know, even in an atmosphere where you can go online and download any album illegally for free, people are still buying CDs. And, yeah. you know, not nearly as many as they used to, but they're still buying them. It's still a billion dollar market. So, I mean, multi-billion dollar market. So it's, uh, you know, I, I guess I guess my only point is that there is a mysterious quality to to consumer choice, and um, no doubt we're entering uh, uh, a new future of expanded choice and diversity. Um, but also, you know, my, the subject of my book is sort of about how below all of these legitimate services is a giant black market, which is destabilizing these services, and um, you know. What, what sort of the idea that, um, that really um, uh, makes me wonder is, let's say in a perfect world, you know, piracy isn't done away with, but it's more effectively marginalized and a consumer all of a sudden has to say, okay, well, I have my, I'm not going to get it for free as easily as I used to. Do I use the streaming service? Do I pay a subscription for that? Or if I'm going to be paying money for a digital album, would I rather just get something physical? You know, I, I think those it's hard to predict those choices and I, and I wonder what they would be if there were better copyright enforcement. That's interesting. And uh, I wanted to, uh, you know, we talked about curation for a second there, and I just wanted to uh, jump on and talk about uh, uh, the news on Sounddrop, uh, which is a startup that light, uh, started its life as a Spotify app and uh, has uh, gathered enough momentum uh, over the last couple of years to close uh, uh, first a uh, $3 million round uh, last year, and uh, uh, this week it announced uh, a second round of $3.4 million, uh, uh, which was led by uh, the investor North Zone, uh, uh, which is also Spotify's lead investor. So if you haven't tried Sounddrop, uh, uh, 
out before. So uh, it's a way to make listening more social. Essentially, uh, anybody can create a virtual room where people can gather to listen to uh, a specific type of type of music together, essentially like a playlist, and people can contribute to this playlist as well. And the company's uh, aim is now to become cross-platform, so uh, moving away from Spotify as being you know the, the, the main thing that people identify uh, a sound drop with, uh, and uh, uh, you know becoming ubiquitous uh, essentially. Uh, so that's what this uh, new round of funding is. The thing is that this brings uh, the funding of Soundrop to 6.4 million uh, within you know the space of 15, 16 months, uh, and uh, I've seen loads of different reactions on Twitter over this. So uh, it, do you think it's madness uh, that a service like this uh, is getting so much attention and so much funding, or do you think there's something? Do you think they're right on the money, uh, Chris? Do you feel like this is a, a startup with legs? I don't know. I'm highly skeptical. I, I guess, uh, in full honesty, I'm very skeptical of, of all of these startups, given recent history and Turntable FM, I think, being a, a great example of, you know, a new service comes along, it's providing the music in a slightly different manner with a social component, and, you know, there's there's a, a nice round of investment and people get excited and wonder, oh, maybe this is the next big thing. Um, you know, I think Scott's might might be better suited to really talk about it, but in general, I, I guess I sort of wait and see what pans out because there have been so many companies that have come and gone over over just the past five years that um, yeah, I, I, I'm just generally skeptical. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and Scott, uh, this company is also placing a lot of. Uh... Uh, emphasis uh, uh, for for its uh, sort of evolution on on artists actually joining in and creating rooms and record labels getting involved and and so have you got any direct experience with uh, sound uh, sound sound drop and uh, do you feel like this is something that uh, is here to stay or uh, just another startup like Chris said? Yeah, we've been we've we actually done a number of these uh, sound drop rooms with Great. with artists. Um, you know, it's just another way to engage with audiences and, and um, is this the company that's going to win or not or the service that wins or not? I, I don't know that. That, that if, if I could predict that, then uh, my <laughs> life would look yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Every, I would be running the world. But, um, You'd have golden headphones on. Right. right. Yeah. But, yeah, instead of whatever these cheap yeah. things are. <laughs> but... Um, but uh, but with that said, I don't know which company and which exact service, but I do know that these types of behaviors are, are what people are going to be using more. You know, yeah. they, they, they like more social aspects. They like sharing. They like engaging with artists. Um, it just is how it is. Which one wins? I don't know. Which platform? I don't know. Um, so, you know... From an investor standpoint, you take a shot because there's not a whole lot of competition around it, and you 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 get in and you kind of become the one. You know, it's a, it's a reasonable investment strategy. You know, there's there's one Twitter, there's one Facebook, there's one YouTube. If this is the one place where people use this behavior and it becomes the ingrained one, then it's going to look pretty smart. Do you do you guys think it's more likely that you know? I was just going to make that same point, Scott, about how the internet economy seems to drive everything. It's almost anti-competitive. Like there just there emerges this one major player that sort of controls the entire market yeah. for for a particular service. So, do you think it's more likely that Spotify would or something like Spotify, if another service emerges like Deezer, just ends up, you know, scooping up uh, what 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 what, what I, I, they're trying to do? Yeah, I do. You know. What's interesting is it does seem like this is, this is what happens, but what's interesting is the pace at which it's happening seems to accelerate, you know, yeah. from, from Microsoft's ultimate dominance to its slow change to, you know, MySpace, big one day, and then it seemed like overnight over, you know, and even shorter turntable, yeah. like everyone's on it and then it's over. And it's just, wow, it's going incredibly fast. <laughs> yeah. Um, so even if somebody does dominate, by the time you figured out they dominated, everyone's off to the next thing. Right. Yeah. And the interesting thing is that, in a way, I, I could see SoundDrop as being touted as a feature rather than a company. I've, I heard a lot of startups in, in the last few years that uh, when you share the pitch, it sounds more like a feature than an actual 
business or in its own rights. But the interesting thing here is that if they manage to go cross-platform, then it does become a, a business in its own rights because it manages to bring together people that uh, otherwise would be insulated in, in their own island of, of streaming service. So that, I think that that's really an interesting value that the company can bring into the equation for, for, this, for this service. Um, well, and uh, uh, moving on to uh, another uh, interesting type of uh, 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 curated service uh, that uh, uh, we haven't actually seen anything of, uh, but we can't seem to go a week without talking about, uh, uh, we're going to uh, have a quick uh, uh, look at uh, Beats' uh, latest news, uh, and Beats, of course, linked to their uh, upcoming streaming service, Daisy. And uh, this week, uh, we reported that only a few days after announcing a buyback of the 24% share of the company owned by electronics giant HTC, uh, which was worth uh, $265 million, Beats has found a brand new investor in the private investment firm uh, Carlyle Group. So the group invested $500 million in the company in exchange for a minority stake, although given the price uh, of the HTC buyback, I would imagine that's sort of at least a 40% stake, uh, otherwise it wouldn't make much sense. Uh, um, but no specifics have been uh, given out to the public. Uh, Carlyle Group is a very powerful investment group. Uh, they have a lot hands in lots of pies and could provide uh, uh, Beats with uh, interesting connections on the hardware front and could also perhaps help out Daisy on this front and, and help them maximize the exposure of the service when it does come out. Uh, uh, this makes a lot of sense of course for, for Beats hardware side because uh, it's a very valuable company and the, the turnover is huge. Uh, on the Daisy front do you feel like uh, an investment of this kind from a, from a big uh, company that has lots of hardware connections as well could uh, bolster the fortunes of Daisy and, and its uh, debut when it comes out. Uh, Scott, what, what, what do you think about this? Yeah, I think, I think it, it, it um, ticks a number of boxes in, in making the deal interesting. Certainly bundling the content, you know, the music content in this case with the hardware is a clever play. I mean, you know, uh, you know, iTunes, that's, that's what they did. You know, that's how they built themselves, um, you know, putting an iPod with a music service. Beats is out there and saying, yeah, when you get the headphones, guess what? It comes with all the music in the world. And as new things are released, it just comes with it. Makes sense. You know, in, in the UK, if you buy a new iPhone, it comes hard bundled with either your choice of Sky Sports or Spotify. You don't pay extra. It just comes with it. And and so um, I think there's a, a lot of logic in that, particularly once you put a service in there, uh, a music service, then you know who your end customer is. And for most hardware companies, the problem is if you don't, have, if you don't know who your end customer is, then you can be disintermediated intermediated very quickly, you know, think Nokia and stuff like that, and why... You know, companies like Amazon or, 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 or Apple have been so successful is because they have content, but they also have customer details. They know who they are. This could be a really powerful thing if done right. I mean, yeah. the concept, you see, whether, whether it succeeds or not, I don't know. I don't know what the service is going to be. But if done right, it becomes pretty massive. Chris, yeah, and it's you know it's a, I think it's a huge advantage, and you know just walking around the streets, you see an awful lot of Beats headphones, and young people, especially you know, seem to love them. So um, you know what we're talking about that this really quick turnover in in digital services that may once Daisy actually comes out, that may sort of come into play with Spotify and people becoming a little tired of Spotify and wanting to check out something new. And yeah, if, if if they're able to provide a subscription with a purchase of headphones, and that may expand to other hardware options in the future, that seems to me a huge advantage. And you know, I'm very, I, I'd like to see a more competitive environment in subscription services, so that artists, um, you know, would have more choice in in which ones to partner with. And hopefully, you know, my I'm sort of a one trick pony. I'm talking. I talk about artists' rights, and hopefully, getting them paid more in the future. So I, I'm very. Um, you know, interested to, to, to see that kind of process play out. And, and yeah, I'm hopeful that, that Daisy can be that service that maybe, maybe can become more associated with um, paying artists and make yeah. that part of their marketing. And, 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 you know, just going back again, I, I, I don't, I, I can't speak to exactly what their, their future plans are, but if you could think about how people buy mobile phones when they go in to, their, to the store, 
it's like, well, if you just get this two-year contract and you give me X a year, then we'll give you this phone or we'll give you this, this phone for, you know, a, 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 an incredible discount. Imagine if Beats Headphones said, you get free headphones <laughs> for, you know, $10 yeah. a month. Mm-hmm. Um, but you have to sign a two-year contract. Yeah. I mean, how powerful could that be? Yeah. And well, if they haven't I, thought of that, they should give me a ring yeah. and, I'll, and I'll walk them through the strategy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, and I think that would be powerful. I just, you know, the one hedge I have for all this stuff is until, I mean, when I, when I uh, talk to people who are in their early 20s and I ask them, don't tell, I don't tell them what book I wrote, you know, but... I ask them, where do you get your music from? Do you stream it? Do you get it from iTunes? Do you download it for free? Without exception, they download it for free from Pirate Bay. So until that behavior changes, the potential for any of these subscription services or the, um, the advantage that would be seen in, oh, I only have to pay $10 for the subscription fee um, and I get something extra out of it, you know, it, if you as a consumer are thinking, well, why would I pay $10 for a subscription fee when I can get it all for free otherwise? Yeah. Uh, just the potential is going to be yeah. less than, than what it would be otherwise. So, yeah. Uh, has anyone ever questioned who you're hanging out with, Chris? All these pirates and, <laughs> you know, what crowd you are you to, hanging with? You have, you have to read my book. That's right. <laughs> it's a rough story, that, isn't it? <laughs> I've, corrected, I've corrected myself, and now I'm here to, you know, spread the gospel. And in the second half of the show, we're going to talk about Spotify's Spotlight feature, songs as partnership with Foursquare, the YouTube Music Awards, and much more. But first, a short information piece with the DMT's sponsors, Sheridan's. I'm here with uh, Tahir Bashir, and we're continuing our series of segments on digital service providers. Uh, hi, Tahir, and thanks for being on. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, so uh, today uh, we're going to talk about uh, the relationship between uh, DSPs and uh, and the prospective, you know, uh, uh, content providers and rights holders. So how uh, is uh, how important is it to actually understand who the right person to talk to is within an organization, and and what's the best way to do that for for a startup that wants to make a deal with, say, Warner or Universal? Uh, it's crucially important. I mean, I remember when I uh, uh, acted for um, uh, one of the startups that we ended up s selling, so it wasn't a startup by the time we sold it, that we, it took us a year when we first did it to find the right person within the label. And once we'd found them, things started moving much quicker. So ultimately, you need to be dealing with the right people. Um, what is the best way to do that? Obviously, do your research, uh, ask around, use lawyers that have have dealt with them because they have a hotline into them and yeah. um, they, they know who basically makes the decisions and who to deal with. But but if you're not talking to the right person, you're banging your head against a brick wall. Absolutely. And uh, there's a bit of a cultural difference actually between the US and the UK. I've, I've dealt with uh, companies on both sides of the Atlantic. And and so what's the best way to, because I know in the, in the States it's very much a personable approach and you know you actually end up you know becoming friends with some of these people and go for dinner with them or, or having a barbecue. Yeah. In the UK it's a little bit more complex because the relationships don't build quite as quickly. So, so what's the recommendation to find the right person within an organization and actually build a really great relationship so that they can advocate for your company within uh, their own? Yeah, I mean that is actually the key, is if you can, if you can find people that effectively become champions of your service from within. So they really like your service so that we're, when they're in their decision-making role, um, you know, they, they advocate it. That's the key. Uh, that's the key outside of digital service providers anyway. Um, how do you do that? Um, you have, to, you know, ultimately it comes down to time. You need to try and spend time with people. So, um, you know, uh, do the barbecues here obviously if you can do that that's great uh, but ultimately the way it works I guess is uh going to events, uh, meeting people, following up, going for coffees, going for lunches, um, but just getting to know someone and understanding their culture and what, what, what's important to them and being able to show them that your solution deals with those issues. Yeah. And finally, looking at uh, how uh, you can help uh, yourself uh, getting to these people, uh, how important is it to uh, hire the right people within your own organization as a, as a startup uh, in order to ensure that perhaps you hire somebody that already has some relationships built up and, and why do you find those people? Yeah, um, it's not just startups we're talking about here, I mean ultimately course, yeah. you know, there's different levels of service provider, you start up and then actually in the music industry with digital service providers you, you need to scale up relatively quickly because uh, time ticks away, you've got short term <laughs> deals so you need to make sure you 
you're using those those rights. So um, finding the right type of people is crucial. First of all, they need to have the skill set to deal with uh, understanding uh, you know, at the business development level the rights that, that, that we're talking about. So quite often what happens is um, the digital service provider will actually look at the, the rights owners themselves and look at people within those organizations and hire them. Yeah. I mean, if you almost look at you know, uh, the PRS, half of them go on to private uh, um, DSPs. Similarly, labels, they kind of switch, switch sides. I can name, uh, you know, uh, many of the digital service providers, the number of people that have come from labels or collection societies or publishers. So, um, yeah, so uh, it's a very common practice to uh, hire people that have done it before. Great. Awesome. Thank you very much. And until the next segment, thank you. And Christy, we're talking about Spotify, and uh, Spotify this week launched a new feature called Spotlight uh, uh, with the artists Haim and Lordy. Lord or Lordy? Lordy? I say Lord, but I don't know. I think it's pronounced Lord. Okay, Lord. Great. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I started with that, and then I, I overthought it. Uh, which, uh, <laughs> and uh, this uh, new feature, Spotlight, aims to collate and display in a more all-rounded way the material that the streaming platform has gathered on an artist over time. So Spotify is uh, uh, trying to do more editorial. So uh, they do interviews with artists. Uh, they get them to curate playlists. Uh, they record live sessions as well. And so this is a place where they can uh, aggregate all of this content uh, and... Uh, uh, hopefully serve the artists better and uh, and give them more exposure on the platform. Uh, so in, in an interview with Music Allies, uh, 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 with Music Ally, uh, Spotify's will hope maintain that artists will be chosen on the basis of what's bubbling up on the platform. Uh, so hopefully, you know, it won't be just a major label playground. Uh, and uh, uh, Spotify is live now on the browser-based version of the of the uh, service. Uh, it's not yet on the Mac version, at least as of this morning. So. It seems like a very interesting new play, and it certainly uh, goes to answer some of the calls for Spotify to do more for artists. But because it's editorial-based, there's a very limited amount of bandwidth that Spotify is going to be able to devote to uh, providing this for a certain number of artists. So it still doesn't answer the question of uh, of how it deals with uh, uh, giving exposures to uh, exposure to independence. Uh, what do you think about this new service, Chris? Uh, you know, you, you you're also very interested in. Uh, getting more money to artists and finding ways to, to, to do that. So do you feel like this is uh, going in the right direction for Spotify? I mean, it's, it's positive. I, I, I certainly don't have any complaints about it. You could, yeah. if you, if you want to view it from the most cynical lens, you know, possible, then it's, you, you could say they're just trying, you know, it's a PR move in some way, but I, I'm not that cynical. I think, I think it's still a net positive for artists. Um, and, you know, I don't think Spotify I mean, it, it's become, they've become a very easy company to attack because they are legitimate yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, artists do have some agency or at least some artists have agency to take their music down, but really the bad guys are, um, the websites that are making money off of free music or, or the huge tech companies that portray any attempt to, you know, give artists basic fairness as censorship. Uh, those are the bad guys, as far as I'm concerned. But there's still this persistent um, culture of fear among artists and among labels in stating the obvious, which is that there is this huge black market and artists are getting screwed. And, you know, that that is the foundational problem, as far as I see it. And if you can plug that, um, in theory then artists and labels will be in a much better negotiating position with services like Spotify. But right now, Spotify can just say, you know what, the, at least we're paying you something. You know, it may not be much, but it's something. And, and as an artist, what do you, what do well, you I, say to that? So well, I'd say Spotify pays out, and most of these services, pays out about 70% That's right, yeah. to the rights holders. So they're actually paying the lion's share of the money coming in out there to rights holders, how, how that's divided is amongst the rights holders and what their, what their arrangements are um, yeah, they're well, I mean, they're paying, they're paying 70%, but they're paying 70% of really paltry revenues that aren't coming from, for the most part, paid subscriptions. They're coming from free services that are off getting money from advertising revenues. So See, I would disagree. I think this year they'll spend, they're, they're going to pay out over 500,000, no, 500 million U.S. dollars, a half a billion dollars, which is 70% of the money that comes in. And if they're doing, they have an amazing conversion rate of around 20%, um, uh, which is, well, which is a spectacularly high conversion rate. Yeah, 
I, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that they're paying that money out and, and I'm sure it's going to inch up more and more and more as the years or explode, you know, as the yeah. years go on, but okay. $500 million versus, and there's just a number I saw that $4.6 billion invested in artists via A&R, et cetera, by major labels uh, in the past year alone. So if you're looking at the, the environment that's out there, those payouts, even though for a huge artist, you know, you can make good money because of the volume that you're getting. Um, for the most part, you know, it, 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 they're not even playing on the same field mm, I, in terms I, of sales, you know, or, I, I or, would, or revenues from iTunes. Um, well, I, I would disagree, and it depends on what territory you're in, in terms of how much, what percentage of the pie that is. If you're in Sweden, it's it's your well, biggest true. revenue source yeah. ahead of CDs and ahead of downloads. Or the Netherlands, right? Netherlands. Yeah, it really successful. depends where you are, and 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 that also depends on when the service was launched, mm -hmm. because it takes some time to penetrate into a market. So we see the first markets where it was launched, you know, then the second wave, then the third wave, and the fourth wave. So it takes some years to 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 be significant, but even if you just look at something in the States, again, I mentioned earlier, uh, Sirius XM uh, radio, you have 30 million people paying between 10 and 15 US dollars a month for radio. So the concept of already paying this monthly subscription fee exists. And the reason exists is also kind of that bundling. Um, they're paying it because when they're buying a new car and they say your your monthly payment is going to be you know two seventeen a month, but you know what for two twenty seven we'll give you this and they're like sure just add it in there and so how quickly could that same money be pushed over to these which which again doesn't help the market because it's just shifting from one to another but yeah. but you could begin to see how how these subscription services can penetrate very quickly and scale very quickly when they're, when they're bundled offers. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I hope they do. I guess what I'm just, I'm interested in seeing uh, the Spotify subscri paid subscription rate, which is what, you know, uh, 5 million, 6 million now? Yeah, 6 million. Uh, it's getting, getting up into that 20 plus million scale. I think that's when we'll know, okay, um, you know, this is going to work out for everybody and, and, and Spotify can be profitable and artists can get paid. And I Scott, agree. Uh, cause, go ahead. Oh, sorry. So I was just going to ask you, uh, well, uh, um, just going back to the story, like uh, what is your take on, on Spotlight? Do you feel like uh, this is something that you would welcome as somebody that is trying to push artists on, on a platform like Spotify or is it too restrictive in terms of the breadth of artists that could be featured on here? No, I think it, anytime you're, 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 you're featuring artists, it's a good thing, a good you know. Thing, yeah. When when you you know when when iTunes first launched, they didn't really have a big plan of how they were going to populate all of their their, their you know they okay we're going to put some stuff up on the main page. You're like okay, what about the jazz page, the blues page, the reggae page? Oh crap, you know, there's a lot of shit that needs to be programmed, <laughs> and how it's going to be different in different countries because it all is different. Um, so yeah, Spotify does the first few of them, but before you know it, it's like if you listen to indie rock, then there's going to be a whole bunch of spotlights around those, and if you're into hip hop, there's something different. It, it, it the potential is there to just keep growing um, because it's delivering, a, you know, a significant value for the end user. Yeah, that's why it happens. If the okay. end user feels this is valuable and they engage with it, then they'll keep doing it. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, in, my, in, in freeloading, one of the people I interview, Adam Farrell from, from Beggar's Group, and he sort of makes this point that there is this, if you just have this pure streaming service uh, that's on demand, it's very easy for a customer to become overwhelmed. So, you know, maybe part of that um, solution or, or uh, successful model for these streaming services over the long term is identifying what kind of curation or spotlighting um, our fans really going to appreciate and, and be drawn to. Yeah. yeah, it's it's classic, you know, paradox of choice. You know, mm -hmm. consumers demand an abundance of choice, but then faced with this, they freeze, <laughs> um, or they go back to the same old patterns where you go, "Hey, you can listen to anything you want," and they're like, uh, "Really?" You know, because yeah. I'll, I'll 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 invite people over to my to my place, and you know, that have never actually tried Spotify, and you sit them down in front of a, a computer and say, okay, type in any band name you want. And they just 
I don't know. <laughs> they just can't think. <laughs> well, what do you like? Um, I like, I, I don't know. I like everything. And, you know, and you need these kind of little um, cues to help people Mm -hmm. start down that path of discovery yeah yeah, yeah sure and uh, of, and of, of course there's also, also the elements you know in a social situation like that when you're trying to find an artist that you want to play you're thinking you've got a thousand things going through your head like uh, is this appropriate for the situation uh, we're at is this going to keep playing in the background is it, is it does this work with the situation so so it's definitely a, uh, I just got an email from Mark Mulligan his latest post is called the tyranny of choice which is uh, I think an interesting message mm -hmm. title for it and uh, yeah uh, it makes a lot of sense uh, uh, and uh, the, talking about a service that is based in New York, actually, uh, two services that are based in New York, there was a very interesting partnership announced this week uh, uh, by uh, uh, through Billboard. Uh, Glenn Peoples reported this week on SongZell's partnership with Foursquare, both uh, New York-based companies. And uh, this partnership will allow SongZell's users to receive uh, special badges and curated playlists when they check into select venues. So this will be an extra perk uh, for users uh, that, that, that use Songza and use Foursquare at the same time. And there will be also a giveaway for people that reach the second level badge on this uh, particular offer, which will get them 500, uh, you know, up to 500 six months uh, uh, memberships of uh, uh, Songza Club, which is the ad-free version of Songza. So, this partnership is very New York, New York heavy for now. So, uh, Chris, you can probably try it out uh, mm -hmm. uh, because most of the venues are in New York. Uh, there are a bunch of venues in other cities uh, as well. But of course, the plan is to expand this. Uh, I love the idea because there hasn't been much interaction between uh, location based services and streaming companies and how the two can interact and provide a better value for the consumers. Uh, so I, li I like this approach. Of course, it's a, it's a very niche subsection of people that would use both Songza and Foursquare. So that's, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out in the mainstream. <laughs> but uh, I, I like it. Uh, Chris, are you going to use this in, in New York? Probably not, but, <laughs> but I do like the idea. I think, I think it is a sort of a new twist and, um, Songs, I believe, they're in Long Island City and Queens, which is just just across uh, the super fun site called Newtown Creek that I live next to. So, but I, you know, I've used Songs a little bit, and I, in terms of curation, I actually really like the interface and um, thought, you know, at least I like the songs that they were that they were playing when I was using it. So, I, I, I really do like this idea of linking those physical venues and the physical realm, <laughs> the analog world, to the convenience and um, the choice of the digital world, it seems like um, a winning strategy. Now, we'll, we'll see how it works out, um, but uh, it, it, you know, it, it seems like a smart play to me for songs to be going in that direction. Definitely, and it seems like uh, it would also open up the opportunity for venues, if they are able to change the playlists on the fly, to update the playlists uh, to reflect the lineups that they have coming up as well, which is, it could be quite an interesting way for people to discover what bands are playing in their local area and, and what's happening yeah, and, around there. Yeah, and, a, and a, a more sticky way of of discovering this music because you're you're not just you know hearing ten songs from artists that you may or may not remember the names of you actually have a, a memory of of seeing these artists and memories of whatever was going on that night when you go to the show and um, you know I, I think all of those uh, those elements are, are really what makes for a um, an enjoyable experience as a music fan yeah Scott can you see this working in London if and when songs I will launch you yeah I mean <laughs> Yes, I mean, it's funny because I think of all of these things as really interesting, but still um, kind of uh, just a bridge to the future. You know, it's just, it, it's not the end. It's, it's one more step to getting where we need to be. Um, it's still way too much work from the user. You know, if, if we have to spend, you know, the rest of my life kind of buried like this into my phone. I mean, <laughs> this is not this is not the future I see. So fine, we still have to go in, check in, and do this, and peck. Yeah, it's fine, but ultimately, um, you know, I lo I look at a world where technology starts to work for us and rather than us working for it, and I see us investing a lot of time working for the technology right now. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. so. so what what, and what do you, I mean, could you talk more about your, that vision that you, I'm just curious what, you know, well, what, well, it's, it, it's more of a, 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 a global thought, you know, if, if you can imagine, you know, web 1.0 was merely taking the offline world and putting it online, you know, it could be, you know, Amazon books, you know, you could buy it in a shop, but now you can just buy it online and you can search for it. A web 2.0 world where there's all this interaction uh, which is, you know, a Facebook world and it's an Expedia, 
you know, a web 3.0 is when, you know, imagine, all right, so I just used Expedia. So right now, if I have to go to fly to Barcelona, um, and, and I put in my schedule that I have a trip coming up, well, I still have to book my flight, my hotel, my, my airport transportation, everything. In a 3.0 world, it just recognizes that I have a trip coming up. So it'll reserve a flight for me on my favorite airline with my frequent flyer number, which hotel I prefer, get me an upgrade, and, ha and just sort it out, and then just bring it back to me and say, is this cool with you, yes or no? You know, and so what does that mean for music consumption, including with the, 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 the four square and location based, you know, it's understanding who I am, who I'm with, what I like, what I might like. And instead of having me have to hunt and search and, you know, just deliver me stuff, you mm -hmm. bring it to me. If I don't like it, I can push it away, mm -hmm. pass it on, but stop making me do so much work in this world. We have these, this technology that's supposed to work for us, and right now it isn't. That's only because we're trying to figure all this out, you know, right. what, what people want, what they actually do. Um, and so that is the world I, I see with whether it's for any kind of information, no distinction between entertainment or, or, or science, just bring me the stuff that, that, that I might want. Mm -hmm. And the stuff even that I don't know that I might want. What are, what are things that are just going to delight me that I didn't even realize I would want? Yeah. Um, and that's, go ahead. Well, I was just, I mean, it's, it's just interesting to think about what is Web 3.0 and what is that going to mean? I, did you guys see the Popular Science? Uh, there was a Popular Science magazine just uh, got rid of comments mm -mm. on their articles online. And they had a post with basically all, they had all the science of, of why comment sections actually confuse people and, <laughs> and, and scientifically they go through why they're, they're not good if you're dealing with, you know, portraying facts because people get in arguments and, you know, if they see really negative comments out there, even if, even if the article is totally legit, right. um, readers are more likely to come away thinking, oh, well, I don't really trust this because I see that there's disagreement about it. So, but it, it's, it just strikes me as very interesting, you know, because for so long Web 2.0 was like, more participation, more comments, user crowdfunded, user based. You know, right? Um, here comes everybody. But then, I don't know. It just seems like there's this this moderation that's going on, and and people are starting to question things a little bit. I think so. You know, you could think of things like fashion and art, where they don't really ask your opinion. You know, somebody. You know, Anna Winter says this is fashionable, and you should wear this. I didn't. I didn't ask you what you think of it. I'm telling you. <laughs> This is what's in this season. <laughs> Full yep. stop. You know, and yep. you know, and the art world says no. What you, this is this is art. I didn't ask whether you like it or not. We're telling you this is art. This is good. This goes in the gallery. I yep. didn't need a comment section. <laughs> um, and and so so in a way, we are work, moving to a world where. Yeah, there's, there's experts, including people that curate music, whether it's a human, an algorithm, a social algorithm, some combination. Yeah, you do it. <laughs> and, and I won't comment. And my comment is either I paid attention to it or I ignored mm -hmm. it. Yeah. That's how I know you got it right. Right. Absolutely. And moving on to the last story of today, uh, I want to talk about YouTube. YouTube announced the YouTube Music Awards uh, uh, this week, uh, which will take place on the 3rd of November. The event, uh, which is of course organized by YouTube to capitalize on the hold that it has on the music space at the moment, uh, you know, we're all talking about it as, as the biggest uh, music service in the world right now, uh, will feature performances by Lady Gaga, Arcade Fired and Eminem amongst others. Of course, YouTube will also bring in some of its uh, YouTube stars uh, that it created uh, through the service uh, and it plans to be international relevant by broadcasting from a number of, uh, of, of, uh, of cities including London, Moscow, Seoul, uh, Rio and uh, the whole thing will culminate in New York City. So this is a very interesting play from YouTube uh, by, by all measures you know they want to become the MTV of this generation they already are to be honest they just want to consolidate their position with these awards uh, and on the other side uh, I think it's super interesting so let me know your thoughts on that and on the other side I had this sort of interesting side theory which was to do with the uh, 
uh, pro, you know, uh, rumored uh, so far uh, offline mode that YouTube uh, is going to implement at some point in the future. Uh, the fact that this offline mode is in the works plus these uh, uh, music awards, uh, I was wondering whether you think there's anything to these two uh, things as to something that might point in the direction of uh, an actual YouTube music service launching anytime soon. Uh, as it was rumored when uh, the Google Play musical access thing launched, uh, where everybody was talking about how uh, Google was planning to launch two services, one with Google Play and one with YouTube. Uh, I, I don't know, what, what are your thoughts on, on all of this? Uh, well, first, uh, I'm surprised it took them so long. <laughs> uh, <laughs> exactly. It, it, in one way, I don't think anyone was surprised. It was like, oh, really? Fair enough, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you haven't done this before? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, it seemed completely natural, but it, but it brings really home a few things that they own video and people are going to watch. Two is if they're putting on their own show, now YouTube is owning content and creating content versus showing the MTV Music Awards and then you know showing it online or showing it on YouTube. Now it's their content. They own it. Yeah. Um, that... that um, could mean lots of things going forward for for them in the space. Absolutely, Chris. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see what the what how much they actually invest in it, what the costs are like. Um, yeah, and you know, I'll, I think that'll maybe be a signal to what what where they're going in the future, and whether this is an experiment or I mean, I, I agree with Scott. You know, why haven't why hasn't this happened before, even at at some kind of a doing it on the cheap level. It seems yeah. like they could have done this very easily. Um, maybe they're worried, I mean, maybe they're worried about the, the bandwidth of make it, you know, of going in this direction and, and having to shoulder more costs. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, it seems, it's, it's funny how um, people still love awards shows. <laughs> you know, they seem to be getting more popular. I love how when the Grammys come on, like the last two years, the same thing has happened. I think it was both the years where you know the Grammys air. You read Gawker, you read websites, and like, oh, this is the worst Grammys ever. This was so <laughs> terrible. Everybody's on Twitter complaining about the Grammys, and then the next day you find out that the ratings are up. Are. <laughs> you know, the ratings went up for the most they have in ten years or something. So, or then you know the VMAs. It, it, it's just you know another one of those interesting things to note that as much as things are changing in so many different ways, there are these very traditional um, sort of relics of the entertainment past that. Um, maybe people find comfort in, or, or I'm not. I'm not sure what it is, but you know, the awards show is remaining relevant. It must. It must hit something very primal in our brains, like you know, we're cavemen, you know, giving people awards <laughs> for you know, yeah, oh, yeah, right. you really club that animal really good, you know. <laughs> well, I think it, I think it does go back to curation, the stuff we've been talking about before, because you know, where are this new world was supposed to be the long tail, right? Which you know, not happening, but. Um, you know, where you have all these niches and they're sort of self-sustaining um, and you have all this diversity and choice. But what are awards shows really? But taking all of these different cultural elements that are out there and bringing them together for two hours yeah. and people getting to see it all and to participate and to talk to one another about it. Um, well, I think that's part of it. I think we, we also like things in common. We, we, we all need to to have something to bind us together. And sometimes, yeah, it's gangman style because, all right, at least we all saw it once, <laughs> you know, I don't, and so now we can talk about it. Um, and so it doesn't matter on one level whether you like M Miley Cyrus or not. We all just said, all right, well, I better check out Wrecking Ball because <laughs> this <laughs> is what I'm talking about. Yeah. It, and yeah. it, I only have to invest three and a half minutes of my time. So, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah, why not? I think it does become very tribal on that level, you know. Just it's going to be interesting for me to see. Fire. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if they actually manage to tap into local talents as well, because uh, they're, you know they're talking about cities from all over the world. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, it would be a shame if they just put Lady Gaga in Seoul, uh, Arcade Fire in Rio, and somebody else in Moscow. Uh, that is all of the same sort of Anglo-American. Uh, T take you know i would love to see like a, you know a korean artist or you know a russian artist uh, actually come up and, mm -hmm. and, and do their bit so or an italian artist yes 
<laughs> <laughs> Let's get Negro Maro on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah, so uh, that's all good. And uh, the last thing I want to mention is that Vivo launched in Germany uh, this week, uh, just in passing. Interesting news because Vivo is going it alone in Germany and they won't have YouTube support because, of course, uh, most videos uh, uh, on YouTube are uh, not available uh, to the German market. So it's going to be interesting how they uh, plan on marketing themselves uh, and uh, making themselves known to the German audience. And also the other thing is that the iTunes Festival drew to a close uh, uh, with the Katy Perry's gig on Monday. And so interesting to see Apple putting so much emphasis on this event. Uh, they even featured it in the very first bit of the iPhone announcement uh, uh, earlier, uh, actually uh, in September, uh, so last month. Uh, so very interesting to see how much commitment Apple see still seems to have in the music space. Uh, Maybe for lack of exciting things happening on the hardware front so far. <laughs> <laughs> They're still selling pretty well, though. Oh, yeah, it's still yeah. selling very well, so exactly. <laughs> I'm a fanboy, I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, those are the last two things that I wanted to mention. And uh, uh, yeah, I think we... I skipped a few stories because there's just so much to talk about today. But uh, uh, it was absolutely a pleasure having you on, guys. Uh, and thanks so much for joining me. Thank, Thank you. you. And thanks so much for listening. DMT is available on a variety of platforms. As I mentioned, you can email on contact at digitalmusictrends.com or tweet on at digimusictrends. Have a great week and till next time. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.